All right, it's seven o'clock, so we better get started. Uh, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us. Dwayne, thanks again for being here once again. Uh, please remember everybody that you can make donations not only to support this program, but also to support a scholarship, a Dwayne Vandenbush Education Scholarship for a local student uh, to help them go to college. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, be sure to check out all of our videos on YouTube. Uh, you can find uh, all the videos as well as be able to make a donation at CrestedButteMuseum.com. Again, CrestedButteMuseum.com. Please consider becoming a member to support the museum and all the activities that we do, not only preserving local history, and, but also sharing it. Uh, Right now we still have uh, many programs going on, or excuse me, many walking tours going on. We've got walking tours going on through the end of September. They're every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. as well as every Saturday at 3 p.m. So the historic walking tours take you on a trip up and down Elk and uh, also gives you uh, entry into the museum as well and provides an interesting uh, uh, different uh, view on local history. Also remember we're doing closed captioning for anybody that needs to be able to read as they go along. Uh, the closed captioning is a little bit wonky sometimes. So if you have any questions about the history that you hear tonight, feel free to email me at curator at crestedbuttemuseum.com. Finally, uh, we've got a couple of uh, events that are happening outside the museum, but that we are supporting. The Crested Butte Film Festival is showing two films. One is, um, Red Lady Films High Country, and the other one is Born From Junk by Buttery Agency. Born From Junk is all about clunkers and the invention of mountain biking, and High Country is all about the mid-timers and how this community changed in the 1970s and on to become what we are today. Also, we're really excited. Uh, we're partnering with Vinatalk for Frank Barajam's Storytelling Night on Wednesday night, September 16th you'll be able to hear Phyllis Guerreri share stories from her book, Pure Joy. And she'll be reading uh, and it'll be recorded and shared over KBUT at 7 p.m. So be sure to uh, turn on your radio at 7 p.m. on September 16th to hear Phyllis Guerreri share all of her stories about growing up and living and her parents and her grandparents and much more. All right, Dwayne, I'm ready for some trivia. How about you? I'm ready to go. The first thing before we get into the trivia, Nell, I want to show you a couple of books. One's out of print that I've, uh, I'm using for this talk. One is a book uh, on Marble, Colorado, City of Stone that Rex Myers, one of my graduate students, and I did in the 19, in 1960s, and it came out in 1970. So I was very privileged to know some of the old timers who are no longer around. And then uh, this is volume one, but there's volume one and two. And this is a tremendous book done by a guy named Oscar McCullum, who later on lived in Marvel. I became a good friend of Oscar's and it's unbelievable book with tremendous pictures. And a lot of the pictures that you see tonight that came out of this book, Marvel, A Town Built on Dreams, volume one and two. The trivia question is, and now tell them how they got to answer the trivia question before I give it. You got it. Throw your answers in the chat. Um, I, just anywhere in the chat, we'll be able to see it. And uh, There's no restrictions on to everyone and panelists or just to panelists. Uh, that was restricting folks that may not be as technologically savvy as uh, others. So please just in the chat and whoever's first, we'll see it. You may not, on your end, you may not see who answers first. So. If it looks like your first, you may not be. Don't get your hopes up. Okay, thanks. Now the prize this week is gonna be 12 donuts. And if anybody wins from out of town, they can uh, give it to anybody that they know in the area. You just need to let Nell know. So here is the trivia question. I want the name of the person who at one time was ahead of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company steel mill in Pueblo head of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, and built the famous Redstone Castle in Redstone that is still operating today. So that's the trivia question. We already got some answers. Okay, well, we'll hold, I'll hold off on those. You go ahead and get them. You got well, it. 
we what do we have here? Who's first? Uh, Martin Frith with Palmer. That's wrong. I see uh, Ken uh, Ken Jensen's got uh, Osgood. Larry McDonald's got Osgood. Ken, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. You've already got a prize. If you don't mind, we're gonna go give it to the next guy, and that is Larry McDonald, who got Osgood. Hope you're okay with it. A number of other people got Osgood too, but they're a little late. You gotta hit that trigger real fast. I wanna thank everybody for being on. We, we are now up to almost 400 people who have registered, and I, I thank everybody. Next week, we will talk about water and the West. And that will be one of the 10 podcasts I do for History Colorado in my role as state historian uh, a little bit later on. Tonight, we are going to take a look at a very unique town. And that is Marble and the Crystal River Valley with heavy emphasis on marble. And it's in one of the most beautiful spots in Colorado in the Crystal River Valley. The Crystal River heads off of Schofield Pass at 10,707 feet. That's 14 miles north of Crested Butte, and it flows into the Roaring Fork River at Carbondale. And it flows through three towns destined to make their mark in Colorado history. And those towns are Crystal, Marble, and Redstone. High mountains dominate this area with the 14,000 foot high Elk Mountains to the east and then 13,000 foot high mountains nearby. The East Fork of the Crystal River heads off of West Maroon Pass at 12,400 feet, and it flows right alongside of one of the top flower gardens in the U.S. before emptying into the Crystal at Schofield Park. Anybody who has walked from the West Maroon Trailhead up to West Maroon Pass and then to Aspen, on your way to West Maroon Pass, that may be the greatest flower area in Colorado, one of the best in the United States and one of the best in the world. The North Fork of the Crystal River above the town of Crystal goes through spectacular country and is highlighted by Geneva and Little Gem and Snowmass Lakes. The gem of the Crystal River country, however, is marble. And marble is located at the north end of the Gunnison country, 50 miles from Gunnison. And there is a great shot of marble, and you can see the finishing mill in the center of the photograph, and then a lot of the buildings where the workers lived over on the left side of the photo. It is the number one marble town in the world today, and was for a long time before. Massive White House Mountain towers above it, dominated by Leadville limestone, and the pure white marble that exists as part of that Leadville limestone. Very early placer miners came in in the 1860s and 70s, and they panned streams on either side of Schofield Pass. But they were driven out by Ute Indians or killed because the Ute Indians didn't want them trespassing on their land. In 1873, a wanderer named Sylvester Richardson came into the area and with the John Parsons Geological Expedition. When the expedition called it a day in the early fall of that year, Sylvester Richardson stayed. And he walked 600 miles that fall, looking over the coal deposits around Crested Butte of today, admiring the lush and well-watered valleys, and finding White House Mountain with its great Leadville limestone and pure white marble. The Hayden Expedition, part of a scientific survey of the American West, was in the area the following year in 1874. William Holmes was part of that expedition, and on August the 29th, 1874, he ominously observed a mud flood near today's marble, something that would plague the town in future years. And here's what Holmes said, and I'm quoting, Muddy torrents poured down from the upper slopes and dashed over the cliffs into the valley. Avalanches of wet earth carrying many rocks and trees formed near the summits and came roaring down, discharging their masses of debris into the river. And that was Carbonate Creek. And Carbonate Creek would do the same thing 67 and 71 years later, devastating the town of Marble. Crystal. 
not far from Schofield Pass and not far from Marble, began as a silver town with great mines in and around Sheep Mountain, including the famous Black Queen. And there you get a great look at Crystal with the Crystal River roaring right by it. And that one was taken in the 1880s. The camp had a population of 650 in the 1880s before the Silver Panic shut it down in 1893. One of the most photographed sites in Colorado is the Crystal Mill. And that is a power mill which dammed up the Crystal River and provided power to the Sheep Mountain Tunnel and other mines on the other side of the road. It still stands today and it's the second most photographed site in Colorado. Maroon Bells number one, Crystal Mill number two. Crystal was also the home of the legendary Al Johnson, the leading citizen of the town. He was a Canadian from the French Laurentian Mountains outside of Quebec. And he knew how to ski as an early uh, young man. Johnson became postmaster, ran a hotel and a general store, owned many mines near Crystal, and achieved fame by carrying the mail between Crystal and Crested Butte winter and summer. Much more about him in a forthcoming episode on skiing. He was known as the champion snowshoer that meant skis at that time in the Rocky Mountains. Miners, however, around Marble found something unusual about their mines. They discovered first that there was something beneath the surface other than the silver and the gold that they were looking for. It was pure white marble. Specimens were sent to London to be tested for hardness and quality. Test results showed that the marble had a crushing point of 14,500 pounds per square inch. And that was harder than any marble that anybody had ever seen and the best pure white marble ever seen. Two things occurred, one in 1892 and one in 1893 that got marble on its way as one of the great towns in the nation. In 1892, marble got a post office, establishing itself as a town. And in 1893, John C. Osgood of Redstone and the head of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company in Pueblo displayed a large marble slab at the World Columbian Exposition, stunning those who saw it. As a result, marble got the contract for the interior of the Colorado State Capitol building in 1895. The Colorado Yule Marble Company, which got the contract, transported 140,000 square feet of marble by sled in winter, by wagon in summer, to the railhead at Carbondale. A little addendum to this, the inside of the Colorado State Capitol is uh, Colorado Yule Marble out of marble. The outside of the Colorado State Capitol is Aberdeen Granite from the Aberdeen Granite Quarry south of Gunnison. Five different quarries were now opened on the side of White House Mountain. Above the quarries were ramshackle houses. Now there's a picture of Crystal and that the guy that is standing holding his hands kind of in front of the door is the legendary Al Johnson. And that is Al Johnson's store. As I said, he owned a lot of the stuff around Crystal. Above the quarries in ramshackle houses, the quarry workers lived. Many of them were skilled craftsmen from Greece and Austria and Italy. They lived at 9,500 feet. And after the electric tramway was built, the men would ski down the grade to marble, catch a ride back up the line by hanging on to the trolley car, which allowed them to ski back up to the quarry. You might say Colorado's first chairlift. Nell, hit that next photo if you would. And there is Quarry Town. It is a ramshackle list of shacks right above the quarries. And uh, these guys live there winter and summer. Initially and destructively, the marble was taken out of the quarries on White House Mountain by blasting with dynamite. Soon, however, the plug and feathers technique was used. This involved drilling holes into the marble and then putting water in which froze and split the marble blocks where one wanted. Then came channeling machines or wire saws that carved up the marble blocks. 
Mail and passenger service in and out of Marble was provided by the Crystal River Stage Line by 1897. Ominously, in small print, the stage line said, this line will not be responsible for accidents. Next photo, Nell. Now, a fantastic Elk Mountain narrow gauge railroad was surveyed in 1892 in an effort to get marble to a railhead at Anthracite near Crested Butte. That railroad would have run up Yule Creek, crossed 12,200 foot high Yule Pass, and then descended the Slate River Canyon to Anthracite. Anybody who's ever walked from Paradise Divide to Marble knows that that would have been a wonder to behold. The Elk Mountain Railroad never got off the ground. Winters around Marble were ferocious. In February of 1899, a letter from nearby Crystal to the Denver Post declared, and I'm quoting, Crystal is snowbound. The stage road between the city and Marble, five miles below, is under 10 to 50 feet of snow, and the mail carrier has only been able to come through once in the last week on skis. By now, the marble on White House Mountain was called Yule Marble, after prospector George Yule, who was one of the early discoverers of the stone in 1874. He later became sheriff in Gunnison. Yule Creek, Yule Pass, Yule Marble, all named for him today. A tremendous fire in New Jersey in 1903 showed that while granite walls crumbled in intense heat, marble did not and remained intact. Because of its resistance to the intense heat, marble was now in great demand in the United States for its safety as well as for its beauty. Entire floors and walls and ceilings were overlaid with marble to fireproof buildings throughout the country. Quarries in Vermont and Tennessee and Georgia could not keep up with the demand for the stone. Now there is one of the uh, uh, four horse teams that took, this one's taking hay and uh, taking hay from marble over into crystal. And that's how they moved stuff around before the railroad got into marble. The coming of Channing Meek to marble in 1904 signaled the start of a great new era for the town. Next picture, Nell. And there's a picture of Colonel Meek. Meek was born in 1855 and began the Shredded Wheat Company, the American Biograph Company, and Mexican City Streetcar Lines. He became aware of marble by serving as president of the Colorado Coal and Iron Company in Pueblo in the late 1880s. Meek became the head of the Colorado Yule Marble Company in 1904. And before he died in a tram accident eight years later in 1912, he spent over $3 million developing the quarries and the finishing mill and transportation. Meek was the man who put in a 75 foot high derrick that lowered marble from the quarries to the road below. In 1906, a year after Meek came to marble, the Crystal River and San Juan Narrow Gauge Railroad affectionately called the can't run and seldom jumps, ran up the Crystal River and into marble from the Denver and Rio Grande line in Carbondale. And there is the Crystal River and San Juan. It was a passenger line, but it also carried marble out. The railroad ensured that marble now could be sent all over the nation much easier than by taking it out by team and wagon to Carbondale. Very early, marble from the quarries was taken to the mill down below by nine horse-drawn wagons in summer and by sleds in winter. To handle increased orders, Meek replaced the horses and wagons with a huge 110 horsepower steam tractor. That giant machine, which you're looking at right now, with eight foot high steel wheels, had been previously used to haul timber in California. The steam tractor pulled four wagons, each with 20 tons of marble, and greatly speeded up movement to the mill. And there you can see it pulling about three of the wagons down from the quarries into the finishing mill. The finishing mill at marble, 3.9 miles from the quarries, was a wonder to behold. It was the largest finishing mill in the world. 
1,742 feet long and over 100 feet wide. And there you get a great look at it. With all the buildings off above it, these are places where the workers live. There is where hundreds of skilled workers, many from Greece and Austria and Italy, cut the stone into columns and slabs that would go into 400 public buildings and countless monuments and mausoleums across the United States. The mill was protected from snow slides by a 50 foot high wall made out of huge blocks of excess marble anchored in the earth. With the wall leaning towards the river and facing the mountain in back of the mill, slides would come down, hit the river, then the wall, and be deflected high in the air, falling back into the Crystal River and saving the mill from being destroyed. To speed up getting marble from the quarries to the mill 3.9 miles below, Channing Meek constructed an electric tram. Now go back to that previous photo. And there is that electric tram that ran 3.9 miles from the quarries to the mill. And it's got 20 ton blocks of marble on it. Now we go to the next one. And there it is. This one is gonna go around a 280 degree curve at Windy Point. That tram replaced the old steam tractor and with grades of 17%, it looked like a roller coaster. On August the 12th, 1912, Channing Meek and four other employees were bringing several blocks of marble down from the quarry when the air brakes failed. The tram car roared down the steep grade at a high speed. Fearing the car would jump the tracks on a curve, Meek and the men jumped off the tram. All were knocked unconscious. But unfortunately, Meek suffered severe internal injuries and died two days later. His death was a body blow for the future of marble. And there you get a great picture. This is right outside of the quarries. They've just been loaded by the derrick onto the uh, electric tramway and now going to be taken down to the mill. Another marble quarry, the Strauss Quarry, opened up on the opposite side of, Yule, of the Yule quarries and this one was on the east side of the Crystal River. In 1910, a fantastic steam Treasury Mountain Railroad ran to the quarries bringing supplies from marble. No marble was ever quarried, however, and the initial run was the only trip the train ever made. It sat for 38 years before finally being dismantled and sold. There's another great look at the electric tram going down that 17% grade from the, mill, from the quarries down to the mill. In 1912, Marble made state and national news. Sylvia Smith was the reason. Sylvia Smith had taught school at Jack's Cabin in 1898 and then published the Crested Butte Weekly Citizen of that coal town and became an enemy of the CF&I, which she believed exploited the workers working for it. Nell hit the next photograph. And there's a car, there's a picture of Sylvia Smith, forced to leave Crested Butte because people of the town turned against her and nobody would advertise in the paper. Smith came to Marble and began to publish the Marble City Times. She was tall, red hair, champion of women's rights. She immediately began to criticize the Colorado Yule Marble Company and Channing Meek accusing the company of stock manipulation and disregarding the safety of workers. She wrote in one of her editions, quote, its stock selling scheme carried desolation into many homes and has given despair over many lives that cannot give worthless paper back for hard earned life savings. That was the last straw. A meeting was called by the Colorado Yule Marble Company and was attended by nearly 300 people from Marble. 232 signed a petition telling Sylvia Smith to leave Marble, to take a hike and never return. She refused to leave and was put in the Marble jail overnight. The next day, Smith was put on the Crystal River and San Juan train and carried out of Marble for good. Sylvia Smith sued 37 individuals, the town of Marble, the Colorado Yule Marble Company, and the railroad for $52,000 in damages for violating her freedom of the press. 
she was awarded $10,000 by the court and had the satisfaction of seeing some marble businesses have to close because they couldn't pay their share of the 10,000. Smith went to Denver, did some freelance writing for the Denver Post and died there in 1932 at the age of 67, a woman's rights and free speech advocate to the end. Marble reached its peak from 1910 to 1914 with 1,800 people in town. And there you can see it at its peak. Despite the death of Channing Meek and the Sylvia Smith uproar in 1912, Marble's future got very bright two years later in 1914 when it got the contract to supply Marble for the Lincoln Memorial. The contract called for 36 columns, 46 feet high, each valued at $15,000. And there you can see the mill and they're turning out the columns for the Lincoln Memorial. 600 freight cars carried the marble with each car carrying from 50 to 70,000 pounds of stone. Now there is a drum for the columns that were used at the Lincoln Memorial. 40 trains of 15 cars apiece were needed to take the marble to Washington, D.C. And there's the inside of the quarry again with a standard gauge track. They ran cars in there just inside. Everything else was narrow gauge. And these are the drums that are gonna hold up those columns for the Lincoln Memorial. The number of men employed at the quarries in the finishing mill from 1914 to 16 ranged from 500 to 1,000 men working on the Lincoln Memorial. The memorial made marble the center of the world's marble industry. Now we got a series of pictures we're gonna show fairly in rapid fire here of, and we'll go back to the one before, uh, Nell. There is one of the quarry openings, very early, one of the five. Next. There is the cage that would lift people from the tram up to the quarries. Next, there is the inside of the quarry. And you can see the different level. And these guys are working with channeling machines. Next, and there is a great shot of the Lincoln Memorial. World War I took away marble skilled Austrian, Greek and Italian workers. And this coupled with the death of Meek, the Sylvia Smith incident, and the end of the Lincoln Memorial contract caused the decline of marble in the 1920s. Then a devastating fire in 1925 caused $531,000 damage to the mill. And that led marble to the verge of ruin. However, it got a benefactor. In 1928, the Vermont Marble Company of Proctor, Vermont came to the rescue. In that year, they bought the bankrupt marble operation. The following year, the Vermont Marble Company got one of the most prestigious marble contracts ever awarded to provide the marble used for the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. 75 men were the massive block of marble out of the quarry. When first cut, the block weighed 124 tons, easily the largest block of marble ever quarried. A wire saw in the quarry cut the block of marble to its required dimensions, 14 feet by 7.4 feet by 6 feet. When trimmed later to its final form, the block still weighed 56 tons. In January of 1931, the great block was ready to be lifted out of the quarry. Never had such a block been taken out of a mountain. A massive derrick, heavily rigged and with a special reinforced bracing, was sent from Proctor, Vermont, for the lone purpose of lifting the block out of the quarry. On a late January day of 1931, a stout reinforced boom leaned out over the quarry and dr slowly dropped its thick cable into the depths below. The cable was attached to the block, 125 feet below, and then began to ease up with all eyes on every part of the equipment to check for any sign of weakness. After an agonizingly slow ascent, the slow, the great block of marble finally reached the opening above, 
and swung out into the white light of a great Colorado winter. Getting the block to the railroad below was no easy task. Nell hit the next photo. There's uh, the quarry with some of the 20 ton blocks. We'll get to the tomb here in a moment. Getting the block to the railroad below was no easy task. It was moved to the electric tramway and began a slow journey 3.9 miles down to the railroad below. Two electric locomotives, one in front of the car carrying the block and the other behind were tied together to bring the marble down. The trip to the railroad took four days. The front locomotive had log skids in front to slow the descent. In early February, go to the next one, Anel. Now there is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. In early February, the large marble block, now crated and braced, headed east where it would soon guard the nation's dead at Arlington National Cemetery. And a postscript. There is today a huge marble block, now crated and braced, and it's in the yard of the town of Marble, ready to replace the old tomb, which has a serious crack in it. The owner of that block is willing to pay the transportation cost to Washington, D.C., but the federal government is unsure they want to replace the original tomb. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier contract was the last hurrah for marble. The Great Depression came in the 1930s and hit the town like the rest of the nation. Only an average of 55 men were employed at the quarry during the 1930s at the quarry in the mill. And the town population dropped to 150, a far cry from the 1800 at its peak. And then disaster. At noon, August the 8th, 1941, dark clouds and sheets of rain rolled into marble. At 3.15 p.m., a dirty brown wall of water and mud rolled down Carbonate Creek and smashed into the town. A flash flood, water, rocks, and mud smashed into the mountain town, cutting a thousand foot swath right through marble. The mud, the rocks, and twisted trees piled up to a depth of 20 feet. Luckily, no one was killed, but damage estimates amounted into the thousands of dollars. The flood of 1941 marked the end of marble mining. On October 25th, three months after the cloudburst and flood, the last block of marble came out of the quarry. Any marble revival came to an end on July 31, 1945, four years later, when a far worse flood than 1941 hit the town. This time, marble was hit by a 30 to 40 foot wall of water mud and rocks from Carbonate Creek after a terrific cloudburst. Only 40 people lived in town at the time and luckily were not directly in the path of the flood. In addition to marble being nearly wiped out, 21 rock slides cut all communications to crystal, trapping 19 people there. Other slides, six to 22 feet deep, cut off transportation to Redstone. The jinx of the Crystal River Valley, a curse put on it by the Ute Indians forced out, had seemingly come true. Now there you got a good shot of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It's braced, it has uh, got boards around it to protect it. They had armed guards to protect it when it got to the mill. And then it was taken right to Carbondale and by rail went to Proctor, Vermont, where it was cut down to 56 tons. That is a 124 ton block of marble in marble. Marble languished in the 1950s and 60s with only a few people left in town. In 1970, and, and there's a good picture of it again with all the workers uh, right in the mill getting ready to go to Carbondale. Marble languished in the 50s and 60s and only a few people were left in town. In 1970 and 71, Two tragic accidents occurred not far from Marble on the feared Devil's Punch Bowl Road from Schofield Pass to Crystal. In July of 1970, a four-wheel drive vehicle carrying 12 passengers plunged off the road near the Devil's Punch Bowls in a driving rain. 
It went down 200 feet into the snow-fed and roaring Crystal River and killed nine out of the 12. One year later, in August of 1971, three more people were killed when a rented jeep on the side of the road near Emerald Lake above the Punch Bowls. In the short span of 13 months, 12 people died within a few miles of each other on that primitive and dangerous road going into Marble. In 1970, land developers, the Marble Ski Area, Inc. Incorporated, planned a massive development in the fragile Crystal River Valley near Marble. It included a ski area on 12,610 foot high Mount Daly just outside of the town. The developers proposed condos, new roads, and 20,000 people in the valley. The ski area, a one mile long chairlift, allowed skiers to ski 1,275 vertical feet, but it was only open to skiers during the winter of 71 and 72, and only then by reservation, and only then on weekends. Now I just tell you right now, that I'm one of the few guys in history ever to ski the Marble Ski Area because I was still working on Marble History and they allowed me to come up and ski and it was pretty good. Except by 1974, the development was planned on land that was subject to mud flows and avalanches and great opposition came from the town of Marble and environmental groups and the Gunnison County Commissioners and that development was turned down. In 1989, Stacy Dunn, a Denver oil man, had a dream to again open the quarries and mine marble. World demand for marble had increased by 800% in the previous 10 years, and 90% of the stone used in the US was imported from the Carrera quarries in Italy. Unfortunately, Stacy Dunn was killed in May of, of 1989 in an auto accident near Johnson Village. He was coming back to talk to the county commissioners about reopening the quarries, but his family and his company continued his dream. A 70 year lease was obtained from the Vermont Marble Company. And with the town of Marble and Gunnison County commissioners on board, that dream became a reality. The road to the quarry was improved water was pumped out of the quarries for the first time in 49 years, and new machinery, including diamond saws, would now be used. A little postscript there. Before they pumped the water out of the quarries, uh, the water froze. And you're going to see Charlie and Marge Orlowski in the last slide here, and I knew those old timers, and they told me of a secret way to get into the quarries used by the miners to where you, you didn't have to drop in by wooden steps. So I would take my hockey stick and my skates and my puck, and I would go into that secret entrance, and I would have my own rink. And I can still hear when I hit the puck, it go whack, 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 as it echoed. And I got fond memories of playing hockey for a couple of hours by myself in the bottom of one of those quarries on a gigantic ice rink. On December the 15th, 1990, with a crowd of 500 gathered, the first Colorado, uh, Colorado Yule Marble block in over 50 years came out of the quarry. Giant curtains were hung over the large quarry openings in the winter to keep out the cold and keep the temperature inside above freezing. The Carrera Marble Company of Italy has owned the marble quarry since 2013. 80% of the marble quarry goes to Italy to be finished. 50% comes back to the U.S. There are five quarries, seven portals, which are named for presidents, such as Adams and Washington and Lincoln and Roosevelt, and all the quarries are connected by the portals. 37 workers quarry blocks of marble from five to 30 tons. Trucks take the marble to Delta. From there, it goes by train to a terminal in Norfolk, Virginia, or then goes by boat to Italy. The quarries are at 9,500 feet. The company owes 124 acres of land there. 1,500 metric tons of marble are shipped out every month. 
and the temperature inside the quarries is a constant 50 degrees. A new open pit quarry is just opened and another quarry is being opened on the opposite side of the Crystal River. 75% of the waste marble stays in the quarries and 2,000 tons of waste marble is turned into road base and used on the road from marble to the quarries. The machines using diamond saws to cut the blocks of marble cost $900,000 each. One diamond each on the saw costs $50, and the life of those saws are 15 to 20 years. The marble or Leadville limestone contained on White House Mountain has a life of 300 years. So here is the great town of marble along the Crystal River deep in the Colorado Rockies, with Mount Daly and Chair Mountain and Sheep Mountain looking down on it. The number one marble town in the world with the purest white marble and an unbelievable history which has touched the nation and the world. And a postscript. For those of you who are interested, they have a great video put out by a man named Ron Bailey. It's called Colorado Yule Marble Quarry, our national treasure, and sells for $29.95. You know, on Google, you can probably find out how to get it. I've already told you about Oscar McCullum's book and my book, and I will finish now with the last slide. Nell, hit the last slide for me. Uh, one of the last slides. There is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at uh, the Wash at the Arlington National Cemetery. The next one is that flash flood that came down in 1945. That's Carbonate Creek. And then next, and there are my good friends, no longer with us anymore, but I know they'd be smiling if they could see this. What we have today, Charlie and Marge Orlowski who I knew in the 1960s, who I picked their brains and they told me every damn thing that I learned about marble. And that is it. Thank you all very much for attending. And I'm looking at the chat box to see who's aboard.